Okay, so this is going to be a little mini lecture on the topic of gluten. Um, I noticed, I've actually noticed over the past, oh, probably several semesters, the interest in gluten and gluten-free and what all this means has really been rising. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that more people, consumers particularly, are seeing a lot more gluten-free products out on the market. A lot of that is because food manufacturers have kind of honed in on the idea that there's a lot of people who are pursuing gluten-free diets. And as a result, they're seeing it as kind of a money-making technique that if they just throw that label gluten-free on food or food products, then they think more people will buy it. Um, part of the problem with the whole gluten-free thinking, though, too, is that people have a lot of misconceptions about it. And so they, they look at it and they say, well, is it a fad? Is it a diet that will help me lose weight? Is it because of allergies? What exactly is it? And I think a lot of people end up thinking that for some reason, if something says gluten-free, it must be healthy. And that's not exactly the case. In fact, there's a lot of gluten-free products out on the market that I would say are probably very, very unhealthy and more unhealthy than their their gluten counterparts, if you will. So, I mean, you can go out there, you could find gluten Oreos, you can have, or I mean, gluten-free Oreos, gluten-free graham crackers, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free bars. There's just like a, an abundance of gluten-free products out on the market, but those things aren't necessarily healthy for you. It's just simply that those things don't happen to have gluten in them. So anyways, the whole purpose of this lecture is going to be to try to kind of define for you guys what the whole gluten-free thing is about. Um, it is definitely something that is very necessary for some people. It's not a fad. Um, it's not, well, like we just discussed, it's not something that necessarily is correlating to a healthy product, but it is a way of life that ends up producing a lot of health benefits for people who are sensitive to gluten to gluten and this is really becoming a big thing in our culture. Some of the reason for the increase in allergies I personally believe is because we are entering a generation now that is literally being born with a very unhealthy gut. We've now talked about the importance of a healthy gut. You guys have seen the importance of um, having the right kinds of bacteria in your gut the importance of having healthy villi and how that helps you digest and absorb the proper types of nutrients. Also, the importance of those probiotics so that it helps to not only digest and absorb things, but keep out toxins and keep out things that we don't want in our body. But because infants today are being born to a lot of mothers who don't have the right kind of bacteria in their gut, the infants never get the, the bacteria either. So our kids are literally starting out on the wrong foot. And then by the time they get to be, you know, children and then teens, they have a gut that's all messed up and they have basically what we call leaky gut. Their gut becomes very leaky and things start leaking into the body. Gluten is just one of those things when it starts leaking in, the immune system automatically attacks it. And so you end up with this allergic-like react reaction. Now, I don't think that um, this is true for everybody, but you're seeing an increased prevalency primarily because there is so much of an increase in poor gut health today. Now, in people that might be like most of our generation, um, I'm in my 30s, so my generation even, for us, it's, it's kind of sketchy. I mean, some of us have really good guts and some of us have really bad guts. It really gets back to how our parents fed us as children. And I look at my generation, I mean, when I was a kid, I, I very, very rarely went to McDonald's. That was like a treat for us. Um, but I do know that there were some who, you know, would frequent fast food places. And I do know that the box cereals were coming up when I was a kid. And so what's happening is people, you know, my age and probably your age are starting to have kids and these kids now are having issues because of how we were raised. You won't see this in generations before ours, really. You know, my parents didn't have issues with gluten intolerance. My grandparents don't have issues with gluten intolerance. Um, 
you start seeing those issues pop up in some people who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, but it's just not nearly as likely or the prevalency isn't as what you see in kids today. So that's a little bit of a, uh, maybe an introduction into why you're starting to see an increased prevalency in the whole gluten thing. Um, let's get to what gluten is first of all. Gluten is basically just the protein that is found in wheat, barley, and rye. Okay, so it, it's the protein of the grain. And that should be what makes the grain beneficial for you or some of what makes it beneficial and healthy for you. But there's reasons why we're starting to see or we're starting to react to this particular protein. So as you can see, the gluten, oh, let me, let me draw for you guys. Okay. The gluten right there, um, it's, it's hidden within the cells. It's basically the protein in the cells. And so it's situated within the endosperm. So it doesn't matter if you have a grain that is refined or if you have a grain that is a whole grain, you know, like whole wheat or whole barley or whole rye versus white flour or there is such a thing actually as white barley and white rye too. We just don't hear about it a lot. But regardless if it's a whole grain or a refined grain, you're still going to have gluten in wheat, barley, and rye because it's the endosperm. And remember, a refined grain still has the endosperm. It just doesn't have the bran and it doesn't have the germ. So gluten is found in those three things. Some of you who are more familiar with the gluten-free issue probably know that oatmeal is something that's kind of tossed back and forth. Is Does it have gluten? Does it not? Oatmeal by itself does not have gluten in it, but almost all oatmeal, kind of like your, your Quaker rolled oats or your Quaker quick oats, they're processed on the same equipment that your wheat, barley, and rye is processed on. So we say that oatmeal is highly contaminated. If you're going to eat oatmeal, more than likely it's going to have gluten on it as well. Now there's a lot of other grains out there that you hear about rice, quinoa, millet, teff, amaranth. Um, there's a whole host of grains out there that do not have gluten as their protein. They have other types of protein. But these are more or less what we consider our novel grains. It's not something that's, that's produced in abundance in America. And so because it's not produced in abundance, it's also not subsidized by the government, we don't see a lot of products with the, um, the gluten-free type grains in them. Of course, we're seeing an increase because of the increased need for gluten-free products. But our, our staple in this country is uh, definitely wheat. And so that's why gluten's becoming more of an issue. So what I want to go through is basically three reasons why we're seeing the recent trends in gluten sensitivities. Okay, let me first point out a gluten allergy is actually very, very rare. What I mean by a gluten allergy is that the minute you consume gluten, your body reacts. Usually this is somebody with celiac disease, okay? And celiac disease is the only condition in which there is a true gluten allergy. The minute these people eat gluten, they will have what we call an anaphylactic reaction. They'll have a hard time breathing. It will be kind of similar to an asthma attack. They will get hives. Um, and all this happens in a matter of minutes. So for people with celiac, uh, consuming gluten, consuming even the smallest quantity, contamination even becomes an issue. Um, gluten can literally kill these people. So that is a true gluten allergy. For the rest of us who just try to avoid it, we consider that a gluten intolerance or a gluten sensitivity. What that means is that your body is reacting, it's just not giving you an immediate reaction. So the effects of, of eating the gluten, you see over a period of time. They're not things that you're gonna see right away. Okay, so we're talking mostly about gluten sensitivities, not the true gluten allergy, which very, very few people have. One of the reasons why you're seeing an increase in gluten sensitivities, and this is probably the, the oldest reason out there, is because of hybridization. In the past five decades, we have, in an unnatural type way, started breeding our wheat. And so you'll notice here, this is the most ancient wheat. It's called this Einkein wheat. Um, and if you remember back to genetics at all, there were these, there were these boxes 
that you'd have to put together in which mom had two genes and dad had two genes and then all the offspring would have a set from each parent. Kind of like that. Okay, the Punnett square. So with, with wheat, how it naturally breeds is that you will have A's breeding together, B's breeding together, D's breeding together. So that's where you see one type of wheat being AA, another type being BB, and these are called diploid wheat. A diploid only has 14 chromosomes, okay? So the DNA is all housed within 14 chromosomes. What we've done is we have physically bred AA and BB, which wouldn't naturally happen, and we've created this new type of wheat down here that has both the AA and the BB. Okay, when you combine the two DNA, what also happens is now you have 14 from the AA and 14 for, with the BB because they don't combine. I mean, they don't replace each other, they just combine together, and now we have a tetraploid, which has 28 chromosomes. So we have increased the DNA. When you increase the DNA, you increase the amount of protein that's being produced because protein is produced based on the DNA. The more DNA you have, the more protein you're going to produce. Well, what, then what we decided to do is we added even another um, type of wheat in there, a DD, and of course it wouldn't naturally mate with the AA and the BB either, so the DNA just combines, okay? They don't, they don't replace each other like what would naturally happen in breeding. So now we have this hexaploid. Hexaploid has AA, BB, and DD, okay? And this also has 42 chromosomes. That means that there is a lot of DNA. There's a whole lot more DNA in the hexaploid than there was in the original diploid wheat, okay? And since we have well over two times, you know, close to three times the amount of chromosomes, that also means that we are making or that particular wheat is producing a ton more protein. That means more gluten. Um, and this is our traditional bread wheats and stuff. The reason why they want to increase gluten particularly is when you're making bread, the, the gluten is, is truly like the glue. If you want a more um, lightweight bread that will hold together and won't crumble or fall apart, you want to add more gluten. And so they started just figuring out the fact that, oh, you can make higher quality products or you can make products that have the consistency that we like by simply adding more gluten. And so they are producing these plants to give us a better texture for our products. But also there's a higher yield. So there's, there's some other issues going on there too. This, however, is kind of interesting. This comes from the Whole Grains Council, okay? This is one of the lobbyist groups that we talk about when we talk about the food pyramid. They're the ones that promoted the whole 6 to 11 servings of grains in your pyramid because they want to make sure that you're eating their grains. So even the Whole Grains Council, um, basically the federal government, is noticing that there is a problem in the increase in the chromosomes in the hybridization. Um... They state different types of wheat have different numbers of chromosomes, and some studies show that the older wheats with fewer chromosomes tend to have lower levels of gliadins. Gliadin is just simply a type of gluten um, that seems to cause the most sensitivity. There's actually two different forms of gluten. Okay, there's the gliadin, and then there's another one that we're not really going to discuss. The gliadin is the one that produces the most sensitivities in the body. Einkorn, the oldest type of wheat in our current food supply, has just 14 chromosomes and is called a diploid wheat. Durham, which is used in pasta and stuff, um, are tetraploid wheats with 28 chromosomes. Common wheat used for almost everything else, including all your bread and your bagels and, you know, all that kind of stuff, have 42 chromosomes and are known as hexaploid wheats. Research shows that different tetraploid and hexaploid wheat varieties differ widely in gliadin levels or gluten levels. And it's possible to select individual genotypes, basically that's just DNA, with less celiac disease, um, immuno, you know, immunogenic potential. In other words, if we decrease the DNA, you're going to see a decrease in the celiac disease. That's basically what it's saying. So they're even admitting, 
that you increase chromosomes like what we've done by hybridizing wheat and you increase the the gluten in it too. Okay, and this is from PubMed. This is just another um, study that kind of uh, confirms all of this again. The presence of celiac disease, epitopes, that means the, the genetic potential or the genetic predisposition for people to get celiac disease in modern and old hexaploid wheat varieties or are basically our modern hybridized varieties of wheat. Um, wheat breeding may have contributed to the increased prevalence of celiac disease. That was in 2010. So there's studies out there saying that gluten is definitely much more prevalent. In fact, look at the first sentence here. Gluten proteins from wheat can induce celiac disease in genetically susceptible individuals. Okay, so the whole the whole point of this article is basically that by hybridizing wheat, we've increased the amount of gluten and so therefore anyone who has a genetic potential for celiac disease is more likely to actually express it or get it. Um, this book Wheat Belly, there's actually one called Grain Brain too, is extremely popular right now and uh, a very well written book. This is actually written by a cardiologist. In his book Wheat Belly, cardiologist William Davis says we began intense crossbreeding of wheat decades ago in order to produce a higher yielding crop. Kind of sounds like GMOs. Breeders began crossing wheat with non-wheat grasses and induced mutations using chemicals, gamma rays, and high-dose x-rays. Today's wheat, he says, isn't even wheat. The wheat products sold to you today are nothing like the wheat products of our grandmother's age, very different from the wheat of the early 20th century and completely transformed from the wheat of the Bible and earlier. Dr. Davis says that crossbreeding on crack has significantly changed in the amino acids in wheat gluten's proteins. This, he says, is why we have likely seen a 400% increase in celiac disease. That's huge. Over the past 40 years. An explosion in inflammatory diseases. We'll talk about this one. And an increase in diabetes and obesity. Um, glia alpha-9, a gluten peptide nearly absent in older wheats but prevalent in modern wheats, is the most reactive celiac disease epitope. So Dr. Davis is also pretty much verifying the fact that the increase in celiac disease is probably related to the hybridization of our modern wheat. And that's why people could handle it in the past. They can't handle it so well today, though. This also explains why... A lot of people who are sensitive to gluten can go over to Europe and eat bread just fine. But here in the States, they have a lot of issues. Europe's wheat has not been nearly hybridized as much as what um, American wheat has been. Okay, number two reason for an increase in gluten sensitivity is we eat more wheat now than ever before. Okay, this is true. If you just look at our whole diet, and some of this is due to the food pyramid and the whole push towards grains, but grain, wheat is subsidized. It's a really cheap way to feed a lot of people. So when we talk about carb-laden diets or diets that are just so heavy in carbohydrates, what's it heavy in? It's heavy in wheat. Bread, crackers, cereal, granola bars, I mean all this stuff, wraps, it's all full of wheat. So we just eat a ton of that stuff today that they didn't have the luxury of eating in nearly the quantities that we do today in generations past. Um, so there's a, couple, there's a couple problems with this. First of all, if somebody is genetically susceptible to some kind of a condition, if the environment is right, those genes are going to be turned on. But you can also be genetically predisposed to something and not get it, if there's no environmental triggers to turn on those genes. So genes can be turned on and off. What's happening is because we eat so much more wheat today than we have in the past, people who have any kind of a genetic tendency to be allergic to or sensitive to gluten, those genes are getting turned on because they're in the presence of so much gluten. Um, so some of this might not even be necessarily that we've changed you know, ourselves physiologically or anything, there might have been just an equal number of people in years past that were susceptible to gluten sensitivities, but the thing is, is they didn't eat enough wheat to really turn on those genes. 
Whereas nowadays, you know, we, we definitely do. Here's a picture. Um, this picture might be a little bit busy for most of you, but I'm going to try to walk you through some of it. Um, basically what this is, this is, of course, your gut. Remember, here's your villi. Villi are actually close together like that. And I'm going to change this to blue so that maybe, let's see, can you guys see that? You should be able to see that. Um, so those are the villi in the little brush border on the top. So obviously you've got the inside of your intestine and the side that I just pointed to. This side is inside. That's your your blood vessels, the inside of your body. Um, when somebody is genetically susceptible to gluten, what this means is that they have certain proteins on their immune cells and stuff that have a shape that is very, very similar to um, gluten. You can kind of see this with this green, this green square. Notice that green square is almost the exact same shape, or he's meant to hold the gluten. People with genetic tendencies towards a gluten sensitivity have um, DNA that make those proteins that will hold on to gluten. So if they have these proteins running around, what happens is when they eat gluten, okay, and up here, here's the Here's the gluten that they're actually eating, is all this green stuff. When, they're, when their um, intestinal tract senses that there's gluten there, they start producing these proteins down here. And when the gluten comes into the gut and it goes through the lining, right away these proteins kick in and say, oh, gluten's coming in. So it grabs hold of the gluten, and then what it does is it presents it to this guy, this DC. This is a dendritic cell. Um, basically it's part of your immune system. Okay, and it's responsible for telling the immune system, hey, something's coming in, we've got a problem. So that particular cell then goes to a higher up cell, this one, and says, hey, we've got a problem. And you notice it's kind of like a chain reaction, so he's presenting the gluten now to this mature uh, dendritic cell who then, right here, <clears throat> supplies it or presents it to a CD4 cell. This is part of your immune system, too. The CD4 cell says we need to make sure that you know the immune system kicks in now and creates a reaction. So they go through this whole line of immune factors and inflammatory factors and start developing a reaction to... Um, the gluten coming in, and so then it starts tearing down the, basically the villi, and that's what's going to be happening up here, as you start destroying it from your immune system. What it also does is it goes on and it presents gluten to a B cell, and this is another part of your immune system that is responsible for remembering um, foreign objects that you have had in your body. So if you think of like a vaccine, when you have a vaccine, what you're doing is with a vaccine, you're triggering this cell right here to recognize a bug that should be considered foreign, and it's making a memory of that bug so that if you ever encounter it again in the future, you already have antibodies or your immune system already knows this is foreign, I need to kill it. So it's, it gets presented to the first guy. The second guy makes a memory copy of it so that any time you're exposed to that that foreign object again now your immune system kicks in so with the whole gluten thing once you've triggered CD4 B cell makes a memory of it and now every single time that person needs gluten they are reacting to it and not only that the antibodies that are made these little guys by the way are your antibodies right there as these antibodies are floating around your body they often are um, very, very similar in shape to other tissues in your body. And this is where autoimmune conditions start coming in. Okay, so a lot of times the antibodies that recognize gluten might also start recognizing, say, your pancreas. And so they'll attack the pancreas thinking that it might be gluten. And so you get this immune attack against your own body. That's what we call autoimmunity. And so if you start tearing down the pancreas, eventually that could lead to um, diabetes or something like that. MS is another one that's been mentioned heavily in classes. 
and MS, it's the same thing. If you get a memory to gluten, and that memory to gluten, the gluten molecule happens to be similar in shape to, say, your, um, it's the myelin sheath, it's, it's like the insulator around your nervous system, well, then your body might start attacking that, that nervous system protector and breaking it down, thinking that it might be gluten. And so then what happens is you end up with MS. So this is how autoimmune diseases start as a result of first having an allergy to gluten. Okay, uh, thirdly or last, one of the reasons for recent um, trends or upward scales in, in gluten sensitivity is due to what we've been doing to our wheat in terms of harvesting. Um, they have started using Roundup, which we will talk about extensively when we talk about GMOs. But basically, it's a chemical that they started putting on wheat in the last stages of wheat to help it all mature together, okay, and go to seed together. That's not really its use, but they've figured out that it does that because it dries out the wheat. And so they've been using it for that purpose. As we've started using more and more Roundup, this is something that a lot of people have um, an allergy too. Basically the chemical for Roundup is called um, glyphosate and this stuff is wicked. I mean it it just triggers all kinds of reactions in people's body. Um, but needless to say it is it is a chemical. And so notice as we've started increasing the use of Roundup on our wheat, what else has increased? Basically the incidence of celiac disease. Okay, That is the true allergy. So if this is just celiac disease, just imagine the increase in a gluten sensitivity. Maybe it's not the gluten at all. Maybe it's not the protein. Maybe it has nothing to do with a hybridization. Maybe it has nothing to do with an increased um, consumption of it. Maybe it's the body really reacting to Roundup. And this is perfectly possible. It's the third theory that has come out more recently that people are really starting to look at. Um, this was from a PubMed study. It says, Common wheat harvest protocol in the United States is to drench the wheat fields with Roundup several days before combine harvesters work through the fields as the practice allows for an earlier, easier, and bigger harvest. Okay, and you can even see, here's different types of wheat, winter wheat, spring wheat, and durum, and the amount of herbicide that they're starting to put on it. It's quite a bit there. Um... And if you wanted to stop this and actually read through that, you could you could do that on your own. But basically, that, that could be another reason why we're seeing an increase. Okay, and this is another slide, kind of similar to the crazy one that I showed you a couple back, but maybe a little bit easier to understand. So what is the connection between a gluten sensitivity and autoimmune diseases? I'm going to take this a little bit further. Um, I'm going to say, what is the connection between consuming gluten and inflammation? A lot of you guys have figured out in your posts that one of the problems with eating gluten is that it induces inflammation. This is one of the biggest reasons why a gluten-free diet is promoted so heavily today amongst alternative medicine particularly is because most of our health conditions that we're experiencing today are, they have a root and inflammation, chronic inflammation in the body. If you want to help um, lessen the degree of a certain health condition, a lot of times if you eliminate gluten, you eliminate the inflammatory side of the whole condition, and these people really either they're cured or the disease that they had or the condition that they had is drastically reduced. So in the doctor's office that I work in, um, both the functional medicine doctor and myself heavily promote a gluten-free diet for most people only because when we have done that, we've seen that the health conditions that people are presenting with aren't nearly um, as strong as if they continue to eat gluten. So it's a good first step in reducing symptoms in a lot of people especially in the GI issues. A lot of you studied Crohn's, okay? That, that's just a very common one. IBS is another very, very common one. Any kind of inflammatory issue in the gut, it will see some sort of benefit by eliminating gluten because you decrease the inflammation. Diabetes is another one. 
Sugar causes a lot of inflammation in the body. So if you can get rid of the inflammation, then the diabetes seems to subside. It doesn't get cured. It doesn't get treated or anything. But you reduce the amount of damage that the diabetes would otherwise do. Um, arthritis. Somebody mentioned arthritis earlier on in one of the one of the forums, particularly rheumatoid arthritis. I cannot tell you how many how many doctors recently are actually um, encouraging their RA patients or those with rheumatoid arthritis to go on a gluten free diet because the bottom line is it is working on these people. These people don't have nearly the effects from their arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis if they go on a gluten free diet. I have a really, really good friend who has been on massive medications for a very early case of rheumatoid arthritis. And it was really sad the amount of treatments that she has had to go through just to get some relief. It wasn't until she started following a gluten-free diet that she looks and for the most part can act perfectly fine now. And all of her meds have been decreased dramatically, like at least cut in half if not more than that. And if she consumes gluten, she has to start increasing them again. Okay, so there's a very, very direct relationship with the consumption of gluten and inflammation in the body. So any kind of a condition that has inflammation involved benefits from a gluten-free diet. Okay, so how exactly does this work? Here again is your small intestine, okay? These, these are the villi right here. Um, one thing that gluten always does the gluten is the little white guys. Whenever gluten comes into anybody's gut, it automatically will trigger the cells to release a, prote or a protein, here's your cell, to release a protein called zonulin, and that's going to be the blue guys right there. Zonulin is a protein that will kind of flood the gut, and what it does is it opens up your cells. So you can see as you go in here, these cells are more open. Okay, we call that permeable. Um, zonulin is known for opening up, opening up the cells and making them permeable. When cells are permeable like that, all kinds of allergens can go in and start entering the blood system and causing an immune reaction. But what we do know is that gluten always triggers zonulin, which will start to open up the cells. Now, if somebody has a really thick probiotic lining, they can usually prevent this whole thing from happening. But for someone who already has an unhealthy gut and is already leaning towards um, kind of a leaky gut type thing, then all it takes is gluten to open up those cells even further and now food can get right inside the body, not even being digested or anything, and trigger all kinds of responses. So once that happens, a lot of other gluten leaks in. Once the gluten starts leaking in, all of these cells right here are inflammatory cells from your immune system. Immune system kicks in, says, hello, something's going on, we've got to try to fix the area. So how they try to fix it is they produce inflammatory factors. And the inflammatory factors, all right here, rush to the area, rush to the cells, and create all kinds of inflammation. Okay, and these things end up in your bloodstream too, so inflammatory factors basically flood your entire system. Now again, for some people, this is a whole lot worse than for others. That's why some of us don't have reactions to gluten. Others of us do. There's also some different thoughts out there. I know the doctor that I work with, the functional medicine one, he really feels strongly that in 95% of people, this takes place. Okay, so if anybody's experiencing inflammation, you've got to get rid of the gluten. Um, some don't think it's quite so severe, but that some of that could be because they're not having major reactions to gluten but you just have to understand that regardless of how you feel, to some degree, gluten always triggers inflammation in everybody's body. So if your body's already unhealthy, then that could really trigger a lot of health effects. Okay, so then the last part that I want to describe is the whole thing with gluten-free, is it really healthy? Okay, I personally feel that a lot of people benefit from being gluten-free, but when I say gluten-free, I do not mean go and consume gluten-free products. What I mean is you get the gluten out of your diet, the bread, the bagels, the heavily gluten products, and you replace them with whole foods, okay? Fruits and vegetables, and um, you can use some alternative grains like rice and quinoa, 
other grains that don't have gluten in them, but you're replacing them with good healthy foods. You're not replacing them with these these products that are alternatives that have gluten-free plastered on them. Okay, I want to show you guys why a gluten-free item, a packaged gluten-free item, is not necessarily healthy. Okay, let's take a look. Udi's is a very, very common gluten-free brand. Look at their classic hamburger buns. Take a look at the ingredient list particularly. You've got water, you've got tapioca starch. This is like white flour, okay? Starch is just pure starch. There's no nutrients, there's no fats, there's just, there's nothing in it. It's just starch, basically. Followed by some brown rice flour, at least it's brown rice. But then you've got oil, eggs, more starch, corn starch. You've got sugar. You've got tapioca maltodextrin, this is more sugar. Potato flour, that's a starch, sugar, sugar, yeast, sugar fiber, um, and then a whole bunch of other things. Okay, there's nothing healthy in there. Maybe the brown rice flour, but that would be it. Most gluten-free things are like this. They're full of starch, they're full of sugar, with no fiber and nothing healthy in them. Same thing with the uh, UD's gluten-free pizza crust. I have used these before, but using them knowing that they're not really healthy, same thing. We're looking at starch. At least it has some brown rice flour. There might be some fiber in there. Okay, but sugar, start, or sugar, sugar, um, corn syrup solids down here, more sugar, sugar and starch. Okay, that, that will cause gut dysbiosis right there. Basically feeding yeast and everything. Glutino crackers, these are kind of like the gluten-free Ritz crackers, basically. Come down the ingredients, what do you see? Starch, white rice flour, so no fiber or anything, more starch. Um, corn starch, sugar, um, and then just some other basic ingredients like baking soda and baking powder and things like that. But again, there's nothing healthy in that. It's just starch and sugar. Okay, so they're no better for you than what Ritz would be. Almond thins, these are a pretty popular one. If you look at the ingredients on almond thins, we've got rice flour. Almonds are good, at least they have some fat in them. Potato starch, um, and then a couple other things. Okay, so again, other than the almonds, there's not really anything healthy in them. It's just, it's just a cracker is all it is. Um, now what I do encourage people to do when they are eating gluten-free and you are looking at grains, there are a lot of benefits to eating gluten-free grains. This would be really for everyone. You know, we got to get out of the whole rut of wheat, 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 and all we ever eat is wheat. There's chia seeds. There's oats, like true oats. Steel-cut oats are probably a better option. Quinoa, this is a very, very high-protein grain. Okay, this, everybody could benefit from eating a lot of quinoa. Flax, amaranth, millet, and there's a lot of other grains out there, too. So... When I say gluten-free is healthy, what I'm looking at is I'm saying it's decreasing inflammation in the body, but also it causes people to have to go to alternatives that could be healthier than wheat. More sweet potatoes, more squash, more of your starchy vegetables, and more of your alternative ancient grains that have not been hybridized and don't have Roundup sprayed all over them. This does make you healthier. What does not make you healthier is to get rid of your whole wheat bread and start putting in these gluten-free breads that are nothing more than starches and sugar. Okay, so hopefully that helps explain the gluten-free issue a little bit better. If you guys have questions, you can always email them to me, and if I get enough, maybe I'll do another mini lecture. But I hope that this kind of clarifies at least initially what the whole gluten-free movement's all about. Um, yes, it is necessary, but it doesn't always mean that people are doing it right and that they're doing it in a healthier way. Real quick, the whole thing with weight loss too. A lot of people who go on a gluten-free diet do indeed experience weight loss. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. The reason why is because obesity has an inflammatory factor. So you're decreasing inflammation, you tend to decrease obesity too. Um, another thing is a lot of people who go gluten-free tend to um, get rid of depression or anxiety, a lot of mental issues, and this is a whole other topic, but the gluten protein, when it does get into the bloodstream, tends to hook into or go to the brain and hook into receptors of the brain, and when it does that, it can tend to promote a lot of mental conditions. So that would be another benefit to going gluten-free.
So hopefully this helped you guys out.